Hadirin yang kami hormati, sesaat lagi kita akan segera memulai acara pada hari ini. Namun sebelumnya, kami sampaikan terlebih dahulu protokol webinar. Mohon izin untuk berkenan. Yang pertama, mengubah ID screen menggunakan format nama jelas diikuti institusi. Yang kedua, dapat mengaktifkan mode bisu atau mute audio dan hanya mengaktifkan video selama acara. Yang ketiga, silakan atur posisi tempat duduk yang paling nyaman dan usahakan tidak membelakangi cahaya untuk mencegah backlight. Yang keempat, Pastikan jaringan dalam kondisi terbaik dengan koneksi internet yang stabil tentunya. Yang kelima, direkomendasikan menggunakan headset atau earphone agar suara terdengar dengan jelas. Dan yang keenam, silakan juga manfaatkan kolom chat untuk penyampaian pertanyaan. Demikian disampaikan untuk dapat disesuaikan. Terima kasih. Let me introduce myself, everybody. My name is uh, Marianto. Uh, I am one of the lecturer in Department of Geophysical Engineering, Institute Teknologi 10 November. Uh, today, I will uh, act as uh, moderator for this guest lecture. Okay, and. Today we have a special guest lecture from University Science Malaysia, Prof. Yasir Basir. Uh, before we start, let me to uh, introduce Prof. Yasir. Uh, right now, Prof. Yasir is the senior lecturer in School of Physics, Geophysics section at University Science Malaysia Penang. Uh, The educational background, Prof. Yasir uh, graduate from Bachelor of Science Mathematics from University of Baluchistan, Pakistan, and then continue the master degree to the ma uh, Master of Computer Science in University of Baluchistan, Pakistan, yeah. with the with the thesis. Computerization of Directorate General Industries and Commerce Department for Online Database, and also took the Master of Science in Geophysics in the in the Kuwait Azam University, Islamabad, Pakistan. So double degree, Prof Yasir. Eh? Yes, I have the <laughs> uh, impressive. <laughs> Uh, and with the thesis title is Seismic Reflection, Data Interpretation, and Prospect Evaluation of Pakistan Indus Offshore. And then uh, finally, Prof. Ya uh, Prof. Yasir uh, graduate from PhD in Petro Petroleum Geoscience in University Technology Petronas Malaysia with the uh, thesis title Advanced Wave Modeling and Diffraction for high resolution seismic imaging okay and the topic for the guest lecture today is marine seismic exploration okay uh, we can uh, before we start prof yasir uh, there is a special remark uh, from my chief of department mr dua desa warnana Mr. Dwatisa, time is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Pak Marianto. Good. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, uh, let's pray and thanks to Allah, our God, who has been giving us some mercies and blessing, so we can attend and gather this place in good uh, condition and happy situation. Yeah. And I'm pleased to welcome you to opening our This important webinar, I think, uh, entitled Marine Seismic Exploration. And let me start uh, welcoming and thanking uh, Dr. Yasir Bashir 
a senior lecturer at University of Malaysia who's taken the time to share uh, his knowledge and experience with us. Welcome to ITS and thank you so much, Dr. Yasir Basir. Thank you, thank you, sir. Okay, uh, we are very pleased to organize this webinar uh, in collaboration with such a playable partner as uh, USM and look forward uh, to our continued partnership, I think. Yeah. Sure. And I got information from Buin, uh, the several students from USM were also attend, so it's my pleasure uh, to welcome all participants from USM today. Yeah. Uh, in this moment, I also would like to thank uh, Buin and Bapak Marianto and also the team who have worked hard to make this event uh, truly successful. Yeah. Okay, uh, finally, I wish a couple of hours of this webinar will profit us uh, with useful knowledge, yeah, especially about uh, management exploration. Yeah. Thank you very much. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, thank you, uh, Prof. Anang, for the opening remarks. Uh, for hello, student, uh, today, please uh, keep your spirit. To list for listening this guest lecture, guys. For your information, guys, uh, USM University Sign Malaysia is one of the partner of geophysical engineering department. Uh, right now, there are four students continue the double degree to USM. Ah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, not in, in, in UTP. I'm sorry, Mr. Yasir, Prof. Yasir. My P for the next year, uh, our student from Geophysics will continue to the USM. Ah, program. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, department of Geophysical Engineering uh, have the highest accreditation from Ministry of Education of Indonesia government, and also have uh, accredited accreditation from the international. Accreditation for from IAP, IAP. Okay, okay. Uh, so we can go to the special uh, for, to the main menu of today meeting is uh, the presentation from Ms. Prof Yasir. Prof Yasir, time is yours. Uh, okay, thank you so much uh, for a very nice introduction, and uh, especially thanks to Marianto and also Dr. Uh, Warana, Warana. And um, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Les3 as well, uh, for arranging this talk. So let me share my screen. I believe you, you are able to uh, see my screen. Yes, it's clear, Dr. Yasir. This one. I mean, we just take like one minute, one, two minutes to play. Okay, um, until it's starting up. So let me um, uh, just uh, thanks uh, USM that they, they have given me opportunity to be being as a, as a senior lecturer here. And also the geophysical engineering department, uh, which is in Institute of uh, Sapulo November which is in, in Indonesia. So thank you so much. So let me start now. I don't know. Okay. So uh, as, as the, the host has mentioned that my name is Dr. Yasser Bashir and I'm senior lecturer at University uh, Science Malaysia. So as regarding the topic which I'm going to cover today, so because the main topic is marine seismic exploration, but I'm going to cover 
actually i have divided my this talk into three main topics so first of all i will bring you to do how the marine seismic acquisition work so we will discussing about the marine seismic acquisition how we acquire the seismic data in the subsurface actually the ultimate goal of doing the marine seismic exploration is to locate the uh, hydrocarbons so oil and gas minerals and such type of things in in the subsurface but especially in the marine we are doing together with um, onshore as well but in today topic i am going to discuss how the seismic data is acquired in marine then obviously after acquiring the seismic data we we are Uh, we are doing some data processing so there are a lot of things which uh, include in seismic data processing but i'm going to show a detailed workflow how the seismic data is acquired in the field then it comes to the processing center then we go for the structural and stratigraphic interpretation let me remove this screen okay i think it should be so uh, prior to that actually what what is our objective in seismic marine acquisition so normally the main objective of exploring the subsurface geometry such as geology so what we do actually we have the ship here like the acquisition vessel and we send this some signal which the signals in in the sense of it can be sound waves or some other types of wave the pressure waves so the signals will go into the subsurface and reflect back from this below the sea bed because this is all the water column and the sea beds starts from here so once the signal hit to this sea bed and went into the subsurface here then only we can got the subsurface geometry or subsurface geology from the marine acquisition so the first thing what we are going to do in seismic marine acquisition so we are sending the sound wave energy which is used in marine seismic survey to map the geological structure beneath beneath the seabed so let's say this is your source here when we send the seismic waves so which is in the sense of sound uh, let's say i'm talking to you that it's mean my sound waves are going through all this process and you can hear my voice so similar way we use our sound waves and send in the subsurface and when it reflect back from this geometry it recorded into the receiver so all the receiver which is floating on the surface of the water so they will record all the signals then after that obviously we have to do the processing and also what what happened um, uh, we have the geophone or normally in case of marine acquisition we are using hydrophone so which receive the signals and record it on on the each hydrophone then these hydrophones are actually connected with the with the system on the acquisition vessel and the all the data which is coming from this hydrophone will be recorded here so after it is recorded then obviously we have to map the geology beneath the seabed and create using this data so that is called the processing of the seismic data we are going to discuss a main processing steps which involve in the seismic processing then finally what what is our objective is so the some seismic waves can be penetrated from the solid rock and the fluid into the earth deeper layer let's say in inside this layers we have some sort of um, fluid such as hydrocarbon oil or gas oil or gas so we are using these waves to propagate into the subsurface which can pass through some deeper layers and also it reflect back to the hydrophone so then we will process it and there is some other way we can convert our seismic waves from the wiggles to the lithology 
So once we know the lithology of the subsurface, then obviously we can build the petroleum system, how the petroleum system is working in the subsurface. Either we have the source rock, we have the reservoir rock, and we have the cap rock. So based on that subsurface geology, we can identify either this is a prospective zone or not. So this is again another, um, another figure which shows actually the seismic acquisition survey in a cartoon diagram. So as I mentioned, this is actually a survey ship which is floating on the water or the sea. So how the acquisition geometry is on the in, in the marine. So over here in the start of this line, we have the source, which is normally in, in, in the sense of, or it is used as an air gun. There are many different types of sources, which we are going to discuss today as well. But normally for seismic acquisition or uh, acquisition as, as a hydrocarbon recovery, so what we are going to use is an air gun. So once we fire the air gun here, so you can see this black lines, which is shows the propagation of the wave. Because when, let's say I'm talking to you, so my voice is not going on the one way, it's going in all way. So similar way, when we fire the shot in the subsurface like here, so the sound waves will be producing in each direction. So that's why we are, showing this uh, parabola. So the waves are going and hitting to the subsurface geometry. So let's, let's say this wave is going and hitting to this reflectors and coming back and recording to this receiver, which is the hydrophone. And then once it is recorded here, then the data will be going to the ship directly here. Then they can process it. So there are two types of processing which is on-site processing and off-site processing. So on-site processing is normally done for defining your acquisition geometry. So let's say when you acquire your seismic data, let's say one line or two lines or multiple lines, then you process it here to just look at the subsurface geometry. Either you need to reduce the source interval or the hydrophone interval, so that one you have to define over here. So let's say you are using 50 meter or 25 meter receiver interval, and probably you cannot illuminate or you cannot illuminate this type of thin beds or the big structure or the small structure, the pinch out. So these type of things, then you have to decide on your survey area to acquire your seismic. Sometimes, you have to define your offset. Either your offset should be larger because in the subsurface, you have very deep, deep, uh, I mean, you have very deep uh, subsurface structure. So let's say, so let's say this is your full offset from here to here. So now your waves can go here and record until here. But let's say if your structure is here, so when the waves goes here, and it cannot be recorded because there is no receivers here. So that's why you have to increase your offset. So how big is your offset? That much deeper you can see from the seismic. Okay, so the, the now we will look at the uh, some realistic figure. So this is a realistic figure. So what are the steps are, are being done in the seismic exploration survey? So over here, the first step is to find the shot. So when we have the shot, let's say when I want to give you a message. So initially I have to speak. So when I speak, then the waves goes or the sound waves goes. Uh, in, in our case, uh, it is hitting to your ears. Like you can hear the voice and it will process here directly. But in seismic case, so the first step is we have to make the sound waves. So when the sound waves goes, propagate, and it reflects from this, this subsurface material, where we have the difference in velocity and density contrast, which is called AI, acoustic impedance. 
So if we have the difference in velocity and density of this layer, let's say this is V1, this is V2, then there will be a reflection. If this is a constant velocity, like in this layer, so there will be no reflection. So it's mean that whenever you have a different rocks in the subsurface, let's say one is limestone, sandstone, shale, or again limestone. So when the velocity and density is changing, there will be a reflection produced. So the first one is a sound waves produced. The second one is reflection. The third step is recording. And the fourth step is the data will be coming to the ship and it will be recorded in tape or in CD or hard disk like that. So these are the one workflow, how the acquisition works. And over here, just I'm giving you an, an idea how big is the acquisition vessel in marine seismic acquisition. So what are the structure and also the capacity of the marine vessel? So like here, if you can see, this is, is a quite big um, seismic acquisition vessel in marine. And if you look at the capacity, so it has 120 days fuel capacity. So it's mean when you're going into the field in the marine, because marine acquisition is a very big task and it's a, it's a huge business or it's a huge investment on the subsurface acquisition. So you can see 120 days, the production fuel capacity they have. Like here, and also some of the acquisition vessel which have less streamer, but this acquisition vessel has 18 streamer. So it means you can see this is first, second, third, fourth, and so on, all the streamer line. It means you have a different uh, lines of hydrophones. And another thing, which is the speed of this vessel, so it's actually five nodes. Uh, speed so it's normally equal to 10 km per hour so it's quite a stable and big vessel for the marine exploration size so if you look in inside of this vessel so you can see these are actually your steamer cables so in these cables you have the hydrophone installed so you can see this yellow um, yellow one so inside this, you have number of geophones, not geophone, hydrophone, and sometimes geophone for 4C as well. How does they place? So normally your acquisition vessel is here, then your steamers are floating here. So this is one, two, three, four, and so on. So it's like a 18 streamer, as I mentioned in the previous figure. So this streamer length is actually eight kilometer, the cable length. So each streamer can have the eight kilometer offset for the seismic acquisition. And also sometimes obviously with, with the hydrophone, so you will be thinking how to detect the position in the subsurface. So let's say when we are putting this streamer, so we have to put this GPS six detector. So it's called the acoustic transfer ponder so which actually deduct for the positioning so in land acquisition normally you go and place your geophone at the place and you can take the gps location but in marine case you have because the ship is keep moving it's, it will not be stopping so let's say this will be keep moving in this direction and you have to acquire data while it is moving otherwise if it is stopped then your cable will be i mean it will be messed up. So during the marine acquisition, marine exploration seismic, so you have to be careful about the condition of the sea. So let's say if there is a, is a, is a wavy, there, there, there is a wavy ocean, then you have, you cannot acquire your seismic depth. So you have to be careful about this type of thing. So that's why sometime when you go into the field, the sea, um, ocean is not in a good position. I mean, uh, let's say if there is a lot of waves are producing and there are some activities ongoing. So you have to be careful about 
the acquisition. So you, you cannot do during that time. Otherwise, you're, all the cables and the things will be messed up. So that's why it's acquisition vessel has a lot of fuel and energy stores in this. So let's say three months you can be in the field, three to four months. And also, if you look at the geophysist, normally who is working in the field, they can see uh, they have like these type of dresses. And also you can see these are actually your streamer cables. So inside this streamer cable, you have the hydrophone. So it means it's, it's, um, it's a waterproof and, and it's actually inside the cable. Okay. So now uh, if you look at the big picture, um, how the seismic acquisition and the subsurface geometry looks like, so this is a very good example, which I got it from some of the magazine. So you can see th this is actually your ship, which is quite large. We have shown you in the previous figure and it has four steamer, like one, two, three, four. And if you look at the subsurface, how big are our structures? So you can see this is one of the anticline structure. Actually, this is from carbonate field. And the second one probably it hears. And over here, you can see falls, uh, this, this is a major fall. And hope, most probably, this is actually a anticline structure. So prior to design and acquisition plan, prior to have the acquisition plan, you have to look at the subsurface geometry. So let's say in subsurface, your anticline is like this. And if you're doing this survey along this direction, then probably you will not be able to illuminate this antique line more properly rather than this direction. So that's why, as I mentioned, during the acquisition or prior to acquisition, you have to do initial processing in the field. So once you do initial processing in the field, so you will look at the subsurface geometry or subsurface geology, how does it look like? So based on that processing, you will define the acquisition parameters. So let's say for this survey, probably they have gone like this, this way, and they have done the initial processing, but along the, along the anticline, it will be more difficult. So you have to go across the anticline. So if you are across the anticline, then your waves can hit and come back from here and it will be more easily. Rather than if you're going this way, so your waves will be going and coming from the top and from the dipping of the uh, anticline or the fault, it will be quite complicated. So that is a processing part we are going to discuss in detail more. Also, it's not that only we are going into the deep water, sometimes let's say if you're going into the shallow water. So in that area, let's say when you go to the shore, shore line, so there the water depth is not too much. So that's why you have to, uh, you have to have some different acquisition of the seismic survey. So on the left side, you can see this is a small boat over here and you can see a very a small, very small uh, cable maybe small in the sense of the length, not the other other way. So it's a um, low offset cable. So that one you can do in the shallow water. So when you are doing this type of survey, like in shallow water, then you have to use this type of uh, acquisition vessel. And obviously if this is one of the figure, which normally what you do normally when you have the seismic expression together with land and sea or the ocean so if you have the both cases so sometimes you have to feed you have to encounter like a lot of things like animals on the onshore and there's a lot of uh, trees you have to cut it down then you have to install your uh, sources so this in this type of area the acquisition will be more hectic but in marine 
it's not that hectic but you have to be careful about the weather of the sea so these are two different things let's that one you have to consider uh, prior to do the exploration so this is one of the very good example which is actually from indonesia so the seismic survey was done in tanjung jabu so this is one of the area so in that case actually they have the data they have to acquire the data from onshore then the shallow water then offshore so this is actually the cross section which is shown here i mean this one is a cross section and if you look at here so this is your land and this is shallow water and this is deep water so like here uh, you have to be very careful and obviously when you are acquiring your seismic data on land and marine so when you are doing the processing then you have to merge this data so here actually i am going to just discuss about the difficulties and the challenges which were faced during this seismic survey so the first um, when we went to the they went to the land so you can as i mentioned there is a lot of trees and some areas here you have to drill and you have to put the dynamite because vibrosize cannot be moving in this area so you must have to use the vibrosize or some type of sources which can be used on offshore onshore then in shallow water like there was two type of um two types of uh, i mean drilling catam marns so obviously when you have to put the dynamite in the subsurface to produce the sound waves so that one was done by drilling then this second task so over here if you see the line which was passing through this area so this is actually the green line which shows the shallow water and onshore seismic acquisition and on the other side this the green line shows the offshore seismic ex exploration so then uh, moving from shallow water to the deep water then we they have used this type of acquisition vessel so the main challenging of this task was to do the processing of this data set so on the left side you can see from a to b is actually your data which was acquired in land of onshore and on the right side is the data which was acquired on offshore i mean in the shallow water then it was in the deep water so this was before the processing so obviously we have to merge the data set because this acquisition was done separately and this one separately so now we have to then merge this um, uh, the data set so now after merging this two data set which is the onshore and this is offshore so you can see it's a quite um, it was quite done properly so that's why you can see all the reflectors are matched and the signal ratio is also very accurate so there is no dis disruption or nothing else is going on so now we move to the marine seismic exploration sources so as i mentioned we are using mainly the sound waves but there are some sources which is used in offshore or in marine so the first source which is the explosive source using dynamite so dynamite is normally is a blasting material so normally which is used uh, for seismic exploration in the area where your vibrosize cannot move and you need a very high frequencies waves so let's say if you're going into the road side area then your vibrosize can go and and do the vibration but when you are moving to the uh, area where you have the jungle or this type of thing then you have to use the dynamite so in marine case also you have to you have the options so either you use the dynamite or either you use the air gun so there are some explosive source which is flexiotor and maxi pulses so these are actually some source which is explosive source you can see this is one of the 
MaxiPulse uh, example over here. And the second source, which we are using in seismic exploration industry or oil and gas industry, which is mostly non-explosive sources. So the first source, which actually uh, used to be used to be acquired, which was Sparker. So normally, uh, what we do in in this type of source, we suddenly discharge the current between the two electrodes in the water generated seismic waves. So when we have the one electrode from second electrode and we, um, we suddenly discharge the current between these electrodes. So then the waves will be produced. And the second one is a boomer. So it's actually passes the current from the coil and move the plate against the water. Here is a picture of this one. Yeah, this one. And aquapulse, this is actually, is also a very well-known um, source, but I don't have an example. But lastly, which is air gun, normally this air gun is suggested and we use for exploration industry. Why we use air gun? Because this is safe for the marine lives. Like we have a lot of fishes and marine animals. So we have to be careful when we are acquiring data. So because of the explosive sources, probably we, we can lose the life of some marine animals. So that's why we have to use some air gun, which is safe and safe and uh, secure as well. So how does uh, the air gun looks like? So over here is a, a cartoon picture. From here, you can see this is a floating slender. So actually it floats on the surface of the seawater. And these are the cables, which is or called the rope. And from here, you can define the depth of the, uh, depth of the uh, air gun. So let's say if you want to have the air gun six meter below the water, then you can tow this rope into the water to bring your sources down. So it's depend on the water depth and also the uh, also the condition of the uh, waves on the surface of the water. That's why you have to bring your uh, air gun a little bit down into the water. Similarly for the for the Hydrophone, you, you cannot float it on the surface of the water. Otherwise, it will be floating and you will be having the noise recorded in this hydrophone. And uh, this is actually your ear gun. And if you look at the real picture, so this is one of the real pictures. So this is a slender. And these are some ear guns which is floating, which is on this, uh, on this platform. So it, it, it's not compulsory that we are using only one air gun. Sometimes we have different air guns. So in this case, we have four air guns. So one, two, three, four. So this can be done simultan simultaneously or it can be fired together. So if you need a very high frequency and you want to send your waves, uh, I mean, for high resolution, high frequency, then you can fire all this one but the depth of penetration will be low. So that's why we have to start from the low frequency, then go into the high frequencies. Okay. So uh, that's about the ear gun, how we use this ear gun to produce the seismic signals. So uh, another things which we have to consider is in marine exploration seismic. So we have to consider the azimuth. So the one thing I have explained, let's say your structure is like this. So what's your, the best idea? You want to go here in this way or this way? So this is called cross line. This is called in line. So if your structure is like this, then you have to go like, you, you have to do your acquisition in this direction. If you're doing in this direction, you can just see one empty line. So the second thing is azimuth. Azimuth is actually, 
is very important for locating in the subsurface when it is a complex structure. So there are different type of survey, which is normally a different type. I, I will discuss in detail. So let's say this is your ship. I mean, acquisition vessel. This is your source. And these are your acquisition geometry in the sense of hydrophone. So when we are acquiring in this way, so this is called single azimuth or it's called narrow azimuth as well. So if you look at in this diagram, so you can see the angles will be recovered like this one. But when we move a different sources and different acquisition vessel, so in this case, let's say we have four acquisition vessels and we have the four sources and two streamer. So in this way, what you can see, you can see the waves will come from here, come from here, goes to here. I mean, if you look at the CDP point, because when you produce the waves, it goes in each direction. So it means this area will be recovered. But in this case, only this area will be covered for your subsurface illumination. So the third geometry, which is called, so this one is actually called wide azimuth. So wide azimuth, sorry. Then now we are moving into the multi azimuth. So in multi azimuth, we have the each directions. So in multi azimuth, what we do, we have this type of survey, but we bring it to different direction. So let's say this is your structure. You are going from this way, going for this way, going for this way. So it means your structure will be more accurately, uh, more ac accurately illuminated. So it will be uh, quite beneficial for subsurface. So you can see you have increased number of fold. So let's say if you're looking at this bottle, okay, let's say this bottle. So if you're looking from this side, so you can see only this portion. But if, if I'm looking from this side, and this side, so this you can illuminate or you can see this bottle or the structure of the bottle more clearly. So similar way in subsurface, we have a different type of structure like dipping structure, um, another type of structure. So the azimuth is very important. If you're looking only in this way, then you cannot illuminate these edges. So you have to go in this way, this way. So different direction, then it will be more clear to you. So that is called multi azimuth. Then another survey which is done is rich azimuth. So in rich azimuth, what happens? So we have different number of sources, and this, I mean, this plus this, and and it, it, yeah, this plus this, you can have the rich azimuth. And the last, which is the full azimuth survey. Full azimuth, what happened? So in this, you have to do like, I'm giving an example of this one. So if you're going this way, this way, or this way, but for rich and full azimuth, so you have to go like this way. So you have to be round and round. So similar way, your acquisition vessel will be, if your, your structure is here, let's say in middle, so you will be going like this one, this one, so all the way you will recover this subsurface geometry. So the main objective of uh, these azimuthal survey is to, to get the complex target, in which case the azimuthal diversity is more important than offset. If your structure is very small, but it's very complex, then it doesn't matter how big is your offset, but your azimuth will be more better. And also this azimuthal survey will provide the better signal to noise ratio. So that's the benefit of this survey. So this is one of the example. It's a real example from, from Malaysia, one of the offshore field. So over here you can, I'm just giving you an idea how big is our survey. So it was done in 2006, then the recording length was 5.7 seconds. So it's been the depth. If you can convert from time to depth, it's almost eight kilometer. Eight kilometer is your depth if you use the 
uh, one and a half velocity. And recording filter was three hertz plus uh, two one eight hertz. So it means we are not getting the frequency below three hertz and not going above two one eight. So there were number of sources too. And the main thing is the source depth, which I'm mentioning. The source depth was six meters. So that's why I, I'm, I was telling you that we have the air gun. So air gun should be go a bit down into the water. So it was six meter. And if you look at the cable length, it was also six meter. And the short interval was 18 meter. So it means the ship is keep moving here. And once it will fire the shot here, then it goes the second position, it will again fire the shot. And number of groups, it means the num number of uh, hydrophone in one streamer. So it was actually 384. And the cable separation was 75 meters. So it means one cable, second cable. So this distance was 75 meters. And group interval, which is normally it's a hydrophone interval, was 12.5 millimeter. You, in the cable, you have hydrophone one, two, three, four. Actually, there was 384 hydrophone. So 384 hydrophone was here in one line. And near offset was eight meter. So near offset from short to this point was eight meter. And if you look at this cable length was 4,800 meters. So it's been around five kilometer. So this total was five kilometer. And if you look at this is one kilometer. So it means it's a huge survey. So when, if you go into the field, so five to six meter, your cables are uh, on the surface of the water and you have to acquire the data. And how does it acquire? So it's a simple animation. Let's say this is your area. This is your area. You have to acquire the data here. So normally, uh, if you have this type of survey, so you have to, let's say you have six cable here. So your ship will be going in this way. Let's say it goes around this way. Then it will not be coming back like this one. But it has to go and come take a big round. Then it will be coming here. Then again, it will go take a big round because the big, big cables, so they will not just take the cable in and put it back. So they have to take a big round, maybe like uh, five kilometer have to take a round of 10 kilometer. So maybe 10 to 20 kilometers. So it's taking a lot of time of your seismic survey. So it's a similar way. So let's say in this area, we can acquire in three times. So this was the simple elimination. So again, so the first one, second, and third. One. So it's going, taking a big round from here. So as I mentioned, this is a single azimuth. So we have the ship here and passing through here. If it is a multi azimuth, so we have different lines. I mean, it's passing here, this way, and this way. Then again, similarly, we have the rich azimuth. So you can have one survey, two survey, three survey, and maybe you can have in other way. So it's rich azimuth. So how does it, the coil shooting will be done? So this is a little bit realistic picture, but it's still the Cowton diagram. So this is called the full azimuth. So you can see the picture, how does it look like? So you can have like, so your ship is moving in this direction. And there is another type of survey in which normally, uh, which is called full azimuth long offset. So let's say if your subsurface structure is very deep, as well as you want to do full azimuth. So in that case, normally you use two recording vessels and two sources. So like in here, you are using only one cable and one source. So if you have, if you, your structure is very deep, deep then you have to use uh, two recording vessels and two source cables. So like here, you can see this is one and this is two. And you have obviously, one source will be here, the second will be here, third and fourth and so on. 
So then your data will be acquired more properly. So another technology which is um, which is uh, which is which came, I think, in 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 the start of this century, it was called OBC. So until now, I'm talking about the streamer. Streamer. So now we look at the OBC, which is stands for ocean bottom cable. So this is one of the picture which I'm showing you here. So in the top picture, you can see a girl is actually want to listen or want to hear something from other side of the wall. So what do you think? Which one can hear easily? Either if you are putting your ear together with the wall, you can hear the sound behind the wall clearly or either this one. So the answer is obviously when you are going to listen a sound or device, other side of the wall. So you must have to uh, put your ears to, together with the wall. So it means this one will, maybe probably she will listen the voice, but obviously he will listen more clearly. So similar way, when we are acquiring our seismic data, let's say our cables are on the surface of the water. And the second option is we put our cables at the sea bottom. So this figure is actually uh, courtesy from SCG. So you can see what happened in OBC. We place our cables on the surface of the sea bottom or sea surface. Yeah. So that is a new technology, which is more expensive and more hectic. And obviously this has more benefits and your signal to noise ratio is enhanced and you can get the true subsurface picture of the subsurface. And this is one of the example which was done in Gulf of Mexico. Uh, in, in that area, the water depth was 7,000 feet. So it's quite deep water. And you can see this is actually the sea bottom or sea surface. So you can see this red dots actually shows the nodes. So now the seismic, marine seismic exploration has enhanced the technology. So for OBC, for OBC purpose, we don't use the cables. So we have the remote hydrophone. So um, it's like a robotic. So you, you, can, you can give the location to that hydrophone and it will go and sink to the surface of the water or surface of the uh, sea bottom. So like these dots, the red dots shows the location of your hydrophone. And these are not actually connected with the cables, but it's remotely can be accessed. So when you fire the shot here on the top or on the base, it will record the signal and it will save into, into, the, into the receiver itself. When you are done with the survey, you will call these receivers on the surface. So it's, it's, it's done automatically right now, but it's more expensive. So this is called ocean bottom cable or OBN, ocean bottom nodes. So that was um, all about the marine seismic acquisition. So now uh, we are going to start the next topic, which is seismic data processing. So now you have already acquired your seismic data. How does it acquire in the marine? What are the significance? What are the equipment you have to use? So now uh, you have to bring your data into the, into the processing center and you have to done extensive processing. I'm not talking about the processing which is done on the field. I mean, on the vessel or in the field, but the processing which is done in house process. So obviously, uh, if you are looking at the recorded data, which is actually the output of the waves. So it's just a simple introduction. What is a wave? So actually the wave is a pattern in which some type of energy, such as sound, light, heat, or even I'm talking to you. So there is some signals which is carried from the waves. So let's say I'm talking to you. So this means I'm sending my signals through the sound waves. So similar way, the wave is something like 
Over here, you can see the water ripples. So when you throw the stone in the water, the static water, so you can see like this ripple smart. So what actually it is taking? Actually, it is taking the energy because when you have the source here, so it's taking the energy and moving this to other position. But when we have the another sound energy, so it will be cancel out. Let's say when when only I'm speaking, so it means you can hear me clearly. But let's say if there's two speakers and talks um, together at the same time, so the I mean the the sound will be mixed up. So that is actually the definition of the waves. How does it record and how does it uh, how does it can be recognized? If you look at the um, another definition, so it's called the wave is the disturbance or oscillation that travels through the matter or space accompanied by the transfer of energy. Again, it's talking about the energy, but there are different type of uh, example, as I mentioned to you. So like we have the sound waves, we have radio waves, water waves, seismic waves. So no, note that the medium does not travel. Obviously the medium is not traveling, only the wave is traveling. So let's say when we are sending the sound waves, so only the sound waves goes into the subsurface and reflect back. So the medium is not moving. I mean, we are not giving that harsh um, source that can be moved to the, like it's happening in the earthquake. So uh, there is some waves, which is called EM waves. It actually do not even need a medium to propagate. So it can uh, travel through space as well. So these are actually types of waves which we are looking at. So when we, we send the waves like so this waves can be goes into two types one is the body waves second one is surface waves so if you look at this glow over here so obviously we are sending the waves here so there is some waves which is called the p waves and s waves p which is the body waves so p waves travel through the body of the earth but s waves also actually travel through the body, but it cannot pass through the liquid. So where there is a liquid or some fluid, then it cannot pass. So only the P waves can pass. And the second type of waves, which is love waves and Rayleigh waves, as I mentioned, it's a surface wave. So it's it's moved through, moved through the surface. It does not go below five meter or 10 meter maybe. Depends on the source, how big is your source. So, so now the focus, uh, just the objective is to show here. So actually we are processing the P waves. If it is a streamer data, like I'm discussing streamer data. So we have only the P waves. And if you have the OBC, which I mentioned the ocean bottom cable. So in that case, we have the P and S waves. So right now for most of the industry in the expression size, me, we are using we have the P waves because the S waves to record in the in the marine will cost a lot because it's uh, ocean bottom cables and we have, we, we have to be, it will be very expensive. So all of the field in the, in the world, most of them are doing the P waves. So in the processing, which I'm going to show is P wave processing, not S wave. It's a similar, but it's in other way. So here is actually the basic um, scheme or the workflow of the seismic data processing. So I will not go through each and every step, but I will just show you the main processing step, which is necessary. So once it comes to the field data, so you, you have the data, which is recorded into the acquisition vessel. So that is called the field data. So after that, you have to do demultiplexing, reformatting. Demultiplexing means that you have the different cables and each hydrophone is, obviously it is receiving, the first hydrophone of each cable will receive the signal first. 
then the second, third, and fourth, and so on. So demultiplexing, you have to do the not the uh, not in the sense of first and second uh, receivers of each lines, but you have to make one line first, the second line, then third and fourth, like like this one. So demultiplexing, you have to do then reformatting. Let's say if your data is in seg D or SEGY, so then your software is supporting some other format of the data, then you have to do reformatting. Okay, so then you have to do the bad trace editing. So in bad trace editing, let's say you have the long cable. In that case, the one I showed you, there was like hundreds of hydrophones. So let's say one of hydrophone is not working well. I mean, it it's, has some mechanical problem, so it considered the noise or something. Then you have to remove that trace and you have to do interpolation on that one. Then you have to do some pre-stack filters. Prior to stacking, you have to do some filter like AGC, PGC, or these type of filters you can do. Or like band pass filter, low cut, high cut, high pass, these type of filters you can apply. Then geometry spreading correction, which is normally uh, it's a Q compensation, which is over here. So you, you can do the Q compensation, then you have to do the trace balancing, like automatic gain control and PGC programmable gain control. So these are all filters we have to do. So this part actually called pre-processing. So it's called pre-processing. And this is main processing. And after pre-processing, you have the deconvolution. So deconvolution is a process actually to acquire the full frequency of your seismic. When you send the seismic waves or the sound waves into the subsurface, when it go deep and deep and deep, obviously there is a loss of frequencies. I mean, it's Q compensation because when it go more deeper, then the energy will go low and low. When it comes to the uh, ground, then it's become, let's say you send the 100 hertz and record it as a 10 hertz. Then you have to do deconvolution. Deconvolution means you have to get back your original frequency. Let's say when you send the 100 waves, 100 hertz wave, then you have to record the 100 wave. So for that process, we call the deconvolution. So there is a lot of process in deconvolutions comes in. Uh, then the main processing, we have the CMP sorting. So like the data is in short gather domain, then we have to convert this data into CMP domain, which is called common midpoint. So that is actually necessary for velocity analysis. So the second step is the velocity analysis, which I'm going to discuss in detail, and also the NM operation. So these two steps, which I'm going to uh, explain in detail because this is a very crucial part of the seismic processing. I can go each and every one because of the time constraint. I will not go into detail. So this is actually hanging around like a root stack. So either after this one, you can go to the stacking, then go for post-stack migration. But we believe that the pre-stack migration is more better. So that's why if you want to go post-stack migration, then you can go post-stack. Then you have to, if you have to do pre-stack, no need to stack here. Come with the pre-stack gain filter, then go for PSTM and PSDM, post-stack time migration, and oh, sorry, pre-stack time migration and pre-stack uh, depth migration. So I'm also going to discuss these topics in detail. Okay. So uh, let's start with the velocity analysis. So uh, how we do the velocity analysis and what is the aim of velocity analysis? So um, when we have the seismic waves going into the subsurface, so we only record the travel time. We don't know the velocity of the subsurface. So based on that travel time, we got the hyperbolic move out of the data set. Let's say if your offset is increasing, then you your 
your offset increasing, then your hyperbolic move out of the reflection will also increase. So you have to find a better velocity to bring that hyperbolic move out to the correct position that is called the velocity analysis procedure. Or also during the NMO correction, you can do that. So for doing the uh, velocity analysis, we have to get the three input data set. So let's say if you're talking about Vista software, we have a workflow in which what you have to take, you have to do for semblance uh, velocity analysis. So you have to get the semblance plot, offset, and CVS. CVS is a constant velocity stack. So this is a general workflow. So over here, this is your input data. Then you do some exponential t power gain and you have to find the mean, FK filter, deconvolution. So that's what I, I was telling you in the process. So from velocity, actually it's not a velocity zone, but it's an input data. Then you have the arms day filter. So you can apply that one. Then again, you have to find the mean of this data set. So from that mean, you can go for offset. I and mean, you can do the offset sort sorting because this was a short gather domain. Now you have the offset gather, so you can get the data set, which is common offset. And the second output is a semblance, so you can apply the semblance plot. And the third one is CVS. CVS you can get is applied by the CVS uh, icon or the procedure you can get the CVS. So this is the procedure how we can get the data set for velocity analysis. So uh, let's let's look at the concept of NMO correction. So why we are applying NMO correction? So let's say here you can see uh, when we fire the shot here. So let's say this is a hammer. When we send the waves into the subsurface, so you see the travel time here is going to the first geophone or the receivers is shorter. But when we go far, it takes more time. So similar way. So we can plot this time. So let's say when we was near here, the time was less here. But if we go far away, then the time is increasing. So it means the travel time, which is taking from here to here is your NMO, normal move out. So when you record your data for horizontal layer with the thickness of, I mean, some thickness and velocity something, so your NMO will be increasing. So let's say this is your horizontal reflector here. And you have a constant velocity and height of this area. And when you send the waves, your hyperbolic move out or the time will be increasing. And how does it look like in seismic? I'll show you that one. But if you see this time from here is a less than increasing. And if you go long offset, then it will be increasing and increasing more. And if you look at the seismic, how does it will be recorded? As I mentioned here, so when you have the near offset, so you will have the less time. So your wave will be recorded here. But if you go far away, then it's taking more time. Even here, you can see if this one is like this one, the first one, and the far one will be going here. Because this time is more here. So it means your hyperbolic move out will keep becoming like this. Sir. So similar way, it's happening here. So you can see your hyperbolic curve is going down. So now the objective of NMO correction is to bring this time to the zero offset time, like here. So this is actually your our input or the recorded data, which is coming in this direction. So what we have to do, we have to bring this time or bring this trace to this line over here. So for that, we have this delta T NMO, which is equal to Tx, which is the total time and T naught is a zero time. So this is actually your T naught and this is your total time. So now you have to bring Tx minus T naught, which you can get this delta T and MO. So over here, you can see the real seismic 
section over here. So you can see the one I showed you. So this is actually your semblance plot. This is your offset and this is CVS. C V constant velocity stack. So now here you can see your hyperbolic move out. Like you can see it's going down, like following the black line. So this is prior to do picking the velocity and NMO correction. So once you pick the velocity, so you, you can follow the trend. Even in the software, when you bring your cursor here, it will tell you which is the correct velocity you need to pick. So this is B4. And once you pick the velocity, then this is after. You can see your reflectors are becoming straight, horizontal. So this was a very simple example, but there are some examples from the, from the uh, book as well. So you can see this hyperbolic move out, you can see here, you can see all the signals are going down. Suppose it should be horizontal, but once you can see here, you can see the velocity is this one. So even you pick this velocity like this one, then you can bring your reflector straight. So now you can see these are becoming straight. So this is before and this is after. Before and after. So this was a very simple case. Now moves to the uh, complex structure. So let's say if your velocity, in this case, your velocity is increasing. So let's say this was uh, 600 and now here you can see 2000, 3000, and this is almost 4000, like this one. But if you come here, you can see there are two trends. So over here, you, you will confuse that either you have to pick this velocity going like this way, or you have to pick velocity like this way. Now, this is the question that you, you, you must need to understand the uh, subsurface geometry. So in this case, actually sometimes what happens then if you have some sedimentary layers, then you have the salt body, and then again, you have the sedimentary layer. So it means the sedimentary layer will have the low velocity, but once it is moving to the salt, then you have the higher velocity then again, it's coming to the low velocity. So th this thing can be happen, but actually this is not the salt body case. But once you see here, you can see your velocity is drastically changing and it's becoming a very high increase. Like here, 4,000, 3,500, and this is 23 to 3,000 and this one. It can go through like this, but when we pick this one, it will not be making your hyperbolic move out correctly at the straight position. So that's why always I, I suggest to my students that you must have to get the knowledge of the geology of the subsurface. Once you know the subsurface geology, that helps you to do the processing. So over here, you, you can see this is example. So this one is picked from this top. So you can see becoming straight, but when you pick this one, so it's, you can see the hockey stack like going up. So that's why the suggested one was this one. The another thing which is called the velocity stretch. So normally when you are picking your velocity, so let's say you pick this velocity and you're stretching it so you can see it's, it's become quite bigger as I shown you in this previous example like this one. So you can see there's a lot of noises happening here. So for this purpose, you have to use the velocity stretch. So to remove the effect of this one. How you can apply? So let's say this was your input data. Okay, this is your input data. And once you do the velocity analysis, then you can see this stretch is becoming here. So it's it's when you do the stacking of this one, it will look like a noise in your data stack. So what you have to do, you have to apply a stretch minute. So you have to apply like 50% and you can apply 100%. So now your data is more clear. So you are get rid of this velocity stretch. Similarly, uh, this is an example. 
which is after an MO correction and stretching your view. So this is your input data. This is after velocity analysis. So you can see here, this is going down here like this one, but this becomes straight for all. And after you do the velocity stretching, I mean, almost like this way, so you can see the better reflection of your signal. So let, let's look at the ultimate goal. So ultimate goal of this NMO correction is to bring your reflectors with this hyperbolic move out to the straight. And once we do the stacking, so let's say you stacking will be accurate. Like if you do the stacking of this data, so this will be noisy, very noisy, like this one. But once you have the um, NMO corrected, then your stacking will be accurately done. There is also some cases where you can do the undercorrected or overcorrected NMO correction. So let's say if you pick the velocity, which is lower velocity, lower than the actual velocity, then it is called overcorrected NMO correction. And if you're choosing your velocity higher than the actual velocity, then in that case, it, it will be considered as the undercorrected. So in this case, Actually, your objective is to bring this one straight like this one. But when you choose the velocity low, then it goes like this one, like it's called hockey sticks. And also this one will go down when you're using the higher velocity than the actual velocity. So what are the benefits of NMO correction? So now we look at the another example. Let's say if this is your CMP gather and you want to do the um, stacking of your data. So the corrected NMO correction will be beneficial. So let's say if you stack this one, so you will get one trace from this offset. But let's say if you have the overcorrected, so in that case, when you do the stacking of this one, so you can see the peak and the noise will be appearing. Even in the case of undercorrected your seismic data, so you can see, like this one, so you, you cannot get the accurate signal. So you can see this is either this signal, this one, this one, and this one. But in case of accurate animal correction, you can get the peak from the acoustic impedance where you have the subsurface layer. So this actually tells you either there are one layers, two layer, three layers. So in this case, you will be confused like this, maybe it's a four layer model. So that was about the velocity analysis. So now we will move to the migration part. So in migration, why we need to apply the migration? So let's say if your shot is here, this is your shot or your source, and this is your receiver. In case of straight reflector or horizontal reflector, so you're CDP is exactly below the CMP point. CMP is a common midpoint and CDP is common depth point. But in case of dipping reflector, so let's say this is slightly dipping reflector. So in this case, your CDP is not exactly below the CMP because it's dipping reflector. So when the waves come here, it will not go in the same angle. It will change the angle of the in this case, you can see this angle, this angle is same. But in this case, this angle and this angle is quite different. So that's why we have to be considered the migration. So I'll give you another example here. So in case of dipping reflector, let's say this is your actual reflector, which is dipping in, say, almost... Uh, more than 50 or 45 degree dipping angle. And this is your surface where you're acquiring your seismic data. So in this case, I'm just considering three sources or receivers. So let's say this is first receiver, second and third receiver. So when you send the waves from here, so actually it comes from this point. But when you are acquiring your seismic data, actually you don't know where is your subsurface reflector. 
you know only the time how much time it takes to receive let's say you fire the shot here and it goes here and come back to here so what you know you know only the travel time but you don't know the point from where it is coming in so what the seismic recorded data will look like it will be looking like this one because you have only the travel time so we assume that the cdp is exactly below the cmp as i mentioned in the previous figure so this is your cmp point and this is your cdp point so when you have the data recorded so your dipping reflector looks like this blue color one so it's mean that the accurate reflector which is the red one will appear as a blue one the another consideration is that either this point is coming from here from this point this point this point or either this point but we don't know the actual position of this reflector so either we move this here over here or maybe it kept over this this place as well so to bring our dipping reflector or the subsurface geometry to the accurate position so we have to apply the migration so for that case we have the sine alpha real which is equal to the tangent alpha stacking so when we do the stacking velocity analysis then we can get the actual velocity of this travel time and based on that we can get the actual position of the reflector so this was the case of the dipping reflector so let's move to the another um, another uh, feature which is anti cline so it's a real anti cline which is shown in the red color and this is your acquisition geometry so in acquisition geometry let's say the waves is coming from here but we don't know from where it is coming so we just in the recorded data it will be coming exactly below the receiver similar way all these points will be coming from the anti cline but it will be plotting exactly below the receiver when we plot this whole reflector or the whole anti cline so you can see the anti cline anti cline the recorded data will be looking like this one so it mean the real anti cline is small but the recorded anti cline will look bigger so to bring this anti cline to this position we need the migration of the data another case is the sink line so let's say in sink line when we send the waves so it is hitting to this sink line so you can see when the waves coming back to the receiver so what it will be recording it will be recording the bow tie so similar way like this is a sink line which is highlighted in red when the wave is coming from this point we will be placing it exactly below then for c which is coming from here because the waves obviously it is going from here as well but i am not showing that one so it's coming from here then we plot it here so similar way so this anti cline will sink line will be looking like a bow tie so when we do the imaging of or the migration of this data so you can see the anti cline will be image on this point so that is actually the purpose of doing the seismic migration that what is my objective to tell you so this is one of the example from the real data so this is unmigrated data and this is migrated so over here is a two example so one is a sink line so you can see the bow tie here which is red and this yellow one so you can see a small sink line and this is a big sink line so in this case in the recorded data your horizontal reflector will be appearing okay i mean you can see all the data which is here and here is same but once it is coming to the dipping reflector sink line and tick line of complex section then you will need the migration so now based on this uh, graph we can look at how many types of migration we can have so the first thing either we can go for post stack migration so you can go like this one or either you can go like this one 
The third one is either you can do pre-stack time migration or pre-stack depth migration. So these four combination can be done. But obviously, if you look at the complexity and also what are the challenges in lateral velocity variation. So you can see the post-stack time migration comes in here. So it's mean if we have, we, this can consider the low complexity of the structure. Let's say if in subsurface you have this horizontal layers and you don't have any complex structure, then you can go for post-stack time migration. Or either if your structure is complex, but you still have no lateral velocity changes, then you can go for post-stack depth migration. Or either you can go for pre-stack depth migration. Obviously this one is the ultimate pre-stack depth migration. So these are actually the increasing complexity as well as the velocity. If you look at the expensive, which algorithm is expensive, so you can follow this one, this arrow. So when we're moving toward this arrow, the complexity and velocity variation plus the price of this migration algorithm will increase. So normally the, in the companies, oil and gas companies, so we don't go directly to the higher migration. First, we have to get the knowledge of the subsurface. I mean, the basic geology, either the layers are horizontal or either it's um, any type of things. So then we decide which migration we have to do. Probably we can go for RTM, uh, full waveform in inversion, this type of things. So once uh, we have done all the processing, so we need a velocity model to migrate our data into the depth, so depth pre-stack depth migration. So once we do all this velocity analysis, you, you see a lot of lines we have. So each line will be processed when we combine all the lines so we can have a 3D cube of the velocity model. So then we have this data set before migration. Then after migration, you can see. So especially you can focus on this area. So you can see, you can illuminate this fault and anticline structure and this type of. In previous one, it looks like horizontal and here you can't see anything. But once you apply the migration, depth migration, so you can have the accuracy of these structures. So this is before migration, this is after migration. Uh, even after the migration, you can do some other type of deconvolution operators. So like FX deconvolution, so over here you can see the continuity of reflectors has been increased. This is migrated and this is FX. So this is before and this is after. Even after FX, you can go for another deconvolution methods. Like here, they have applied the LUM filtering, lower upper middle filter. So you can see this is before, this is after. So now its signal has become more and more enhanced. So this was about the general, or I mean the summarize of seismic data processing. So now we will go for the structure interpretation. So in the structure interpretation, now we have done the acquisition processing. Now we will move to the interpretation task. So why the seismic interpretation is important? And actually we will look at what is the interpretation. So seismic interpretation is a science or it can be an art uh, of inferring the geology or uh, at some depth from the process seismic data. So it means we have the seismic data, we have to do the interpretation of the subsurface geology. Like you go into the field and look at the outcrops, you can look at the layers, faults, fold, fracture, similar things which you are doing geological interpretation, we are doing seismic interpretation. And why we have to do this interpretation? So this interpretation is actually can help to locate the groundwater, minerals, mine, and investigate the landfills. And also uh, some other time we use for earthquake analysis. But especially the focus of this lecture, which we are working on deep seismic interpretation is used for hydrocarbon exploration. It can be oil or it can be gas as well. 
So this is a life cycle of the seismic. So let's say if you start with the seismic acquisition, so the first part of the lecture, then we have extensive processing flows in uh, during the after the acquisition. Then we come up with the real picture of the subsurface. So the task is to do the interpretation, like then we have to define where we have to drill the oil and gas for oil and gas, or we have to find the structure, stratigraphy, or some other types of traps. So now uh, there are some steps to perform the interpretation. So these are very general interpretation steps. So the first step is you have to define your objective. What are my objectives? Such as I'm looking for a regional tectonic, either we are looking for a structure or depositional trend or whatever we are looking. So that one you have to define the objective in your mind. Because the seismic pattern, uh, uh, when you're looking at the pattern of the seismic, it will give you a lot of information. Like you want to do the signal noise ratio, structure interpretation, stratigraphic, structural, tectonic. So these all things can be done, but you have to define your objective prior to start the seismic interpretation. So the second step is you have to build the models and merge your data set. So let's say, not only seismic, but you have the well logs and some velocity models prior it has been done. So you have to combine all this data set. So, and finally, the third step is to, if you have the well logs, then you have to do well to seismic type. Because normally, sometimes you don't have this uh, accurate depth of your seismic. So when you have the well logs, you can convert your a seismic according to your well logs. So then you have the better interpretation of horizon and structure and stratigraphic interpretation. So I will be focusing on this third step, which is the interpretation. I'm not going into the planning or data set merging, but in interpretation, what are your key objective? So overall aim of seismic interpretation is to add in constructing the most accurate earth model or the reservoir description possible. So that is actually main, main objective. So we have to look at the subsurface model. How does the subsurface looks like? Either you're looking for a geological model, velocity model, um, or stratigraphic model, whatever you are looking for. The aim is to identify the model. So for that step, Obviously, previously we was looking at the data into the papers, like we have long seismic section, we have to um, draw all the uh, all, draw all the interpretations from pencil, the color pencils you have to do. But now everything is done by cursor to screen. So the first step in seismic interpretation is to do well to seismic type. Then you have to do the horizon picking, fault picking. So that is actually the first steps normally you do in interpretation. Then the second step is you have to come up with the time structure map uh, with the faults. I'll show you some example over here. Then another steps you have to come up with the depth structure map. So once you have the time structure map, so you can convert using the velocity model to the depth structure map. So that is actually your accurate model when you're defining your well point. Then another step, which you have to do the seismic fishes map for reservoir, source, and sea. When you are going to build your petroleum system, so you have to define each fishes. I mean, in subsurface model, either it's a, it's a reservoir rock, either it's a source rock or the seal rock. So see these analysis you have to do using the fishes map. Then uh, you have to come up with the seismic amplitude map for direct hydrocarbon indicator analysis, which is called DHI analysis. Then also you can do the thickness map of the inferred seismic tuning analysis. Obviously when you find the petroleum system and you know already the subsurface hydrocarbon prospect zone. So then you have to define how big is your reservoir, 
uh, I mean, it's a thick or thin or it's a chromical. So these, these analysis you also have to do prior to drilling. Then fault map. So let's say if you have the, in subsurface, you already have the hydrocarbon, you have the source reservoir, but maybe if there's a fault, probably your hydrocarbon is trapped somewhere else. It can be uh, go along the fault plan. So that's why you the fault map is also important. So you have to see either your hydrocarbon is preserved, which place. Okay, this is a, again the fault maps. Then you have to come up with the isochrone and isopack map. Isochrone and isopack is actually the maps which shows the thickness of each layer. I mean, how big is your seal cap and your reservoir. Then come up with the velocity uh, map for lithology determination or depth conversion. So this is one of the example, which is, uh, is a process data. And also this is interpreted data. So in this one section, there are a lot of things, let's say if you want to interpret this section based on your geological experience or the, as a geophysicist or engineer, you can find out a lot of things from this seismic section. Like here for my purpose, let's say I'm looking for some structure interpretation. So now here you can see a lot of features. Like this one is your basement normally, probably this one is a basement below this part. And there is a lot of unconformity, disconformities. You have the sedimentary strata here. From here, you can see the stress analysis. How is the stress analysis you can do? So you can see which type of faults are these one. So let's say this fault is, is actually it's all reverse fault. So it means your stress was from here and also from, so this is a compressional region. And if you want to look at the uh, amplitude map of this area, then you can see brighter amplitude. Let's say this appears to be a brighter amplitude, the black one. So probably this can be one of the prospective zone or either this one, either this fault has made some conjunction for hydrocarbon. So that one also you can do the analysis on this one. So just the purpose of showing this map, so you can see a lot of things from one side of the section, but you have to define your objective. What is actually your objective? Either you're looking for regional geology, compressional extensional regime, fault map, structure map, stratigraphic. So these are the things you can look at. And also some of the stratigraphic feature, let's say if you're looking for uh, system tracks, like HST, FSST, and these type of system tracks you can also define. Then you can come up with the interpretation of each horizon. Like let's say this is your in line, this is a cross line. See, actually this is a 3D uh, seismic. So over here you can see once you do the interpretation, this is the blue one is very horizontal, uh, horizontal layer. Then again, the green is horizontal. Once you move to this one, so you can see this color shows the different depth. This is actually a contour map. And you can see a lot of things like this one is one of the one of the dome, like salt, salt dome you can see here. So now uh, the 3D data which is come up after the processing. So now we can do the interpretation here. So let's say in this area, which is another example from Malay Basin. So you can see this horizon, which is look in a purple color. Let me highlight it. So we have picked this horizon throughout this section. So once we come up with the 3D um, contour map or the structure map, so you can see how beautifully it has been resolved. So you can see this is an antique line structure. So you can see one, two, three, four, five, and five wells are already drilled. So you can verify here from the amplitude plot. So the brighter amplitude, so when your amplitude is high here, this is low. So the blue is high. So over here, you can see all the wells are drilled on the high amplitude. So this is some of sort of DHI, direct hydrocarbon indicators. So, uh, 
with the summary of this lecture, I mean, the marine seismic exploration is actually we, we are doing for oil and gas exploration. So normally the 70% of our beloved earth is covered with the water. And until now, we have not explored a lot in the offshore. So we still the oil and gas exploration is being done in offshore or in marine. So, so that, that, that is one of the purpose of the marine seismic exploration. And the second thing, which is most important, so we have to be very careful for the marine life, which should be safe. So that's why I, I told you that we have to start, we have to use some type of sources or the equipment, which is safe for the, for the marine life. Like if we, we are using the air gun, so we use, start from the low frequency, then we increase the high frequency. Or maybe sometimes we just produce the very low frequency, so the marine animals will be dispersed. Then we, can, we have the clear area. And also uh, prior to get these permissions uh, to, to do the marine exploration, we must have to go for government license area for exploration. And once it comes to the processing, so ultimate goal of seismic processing is to enhance the signal to noise ratio, which is uh, using some advanced seismic processing techniques and also some deconvolution method and filtering methods as I discussed in this lecture. And also there is a lot of things is remained for seismic processing and acquisition part. It cannot be covered in two hours. And finally, once all the data is acquired in the field and process, so one, then it comes for the interpretation. So which is the main objective of the marine exploration, then we have to prospect mature of a prospect for, and also sometimes field development. Sometimes it's marine acquisition is not done only one time. We have to do one time, then we have to do the, another time to look at the um, EOR, hydrocarbon recovery, enhanced cell recovery that is called. And also sometimes we do the field development. So let's say the one survey was done in 2005, then we have to do in 2022 again to look at how much our results are preserved in our uh, reservoir. Okay, with that's all, I think thank you so much. Uh, I would like to thank USM and School of Physics, Geophysics section. And also I would like to thank ITS for this invitation as a guest speaker. So with that's all, I open the floor for question and answer and any comments if you have. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Yasir, for the presentation of the marine seismic exploration topic. Uh, today, uh, this time, we continue to the question and answer section. Please, student, if you have uh, any question, don't hesitate to ask in chat room or directly to the speaker. Okay, yes, any question, yes? Okay, there is a one raised hand from Mr. Mas, uh, Mr. Eki Komara. Hello, Mr. Eki Komara. Hello. Okay, Mr. Hello, Eki Mr. Komara, Mr. okay. My name is Eki Komara. Uh, thank you for your very comprehensive presentation. Uh, give us uh, more knowledge about seismic exploration. Okay, I uh, I have one question for you. Uh, which more challenging to acquisition in the land seismic, transition or marine uh, for the cost, source, equipment, and uh, data processing? Okay. Uh, let's say if we are comparing the complexity of marine acquisition and uh, land acquisition. So the complex data which we are getting is the marine exploration. Because the first thing is that your ship doesn't stop. In land case, your everything is static. 
So marine in marine exploration or acquisition, so your uh, your your acquisition vessel will not stop. So you have to keep moving. When you fire the shot here, then probably when you you cannot do it again. So you have to take a round and come back to the exact position and take the another shot. So that's why you have to be very sure that which place and which frequency of the seismic source you need to be. So in that sense, the acquisition is more complex for marine. And the second part of your question is the processing. So the processing in marine exploration, the processing is a bit uh, I mean, easier than the land case because in land we have the surface waves, ground roll, these type of things. But in marine, we have uh, multiples. So like interbedded multiple, water surface multiple. So these multiples are much easier to remove rather than removing the land. Because in land, we have cultural noise, power induction line noises. So these are different things. So if the summary of your uh, question to answer. So marine acquisition is difficult, but processing of the marine data is easier than the land. Okay, thank you, Mr. Lesson. Okay, thank you for the question and answer from, the question is from Mr. Aki. Okay, we go to the next question. Hello, guys. Uh, please ask. So, your question, guys. Uh, Prof. Yasir, in this uh, case lecture today, the participant is not only from the geophysics engineering, but we are uh, inviting from the other department. Yeah. Uh, for uh, when we, when in the acquisition, acquisition stage, yeah, acquisition stat. Uh, what is the uh, any contribution from the other uh, department? Maybe from not only geophysics, any any contribution from the other? Uh, yeah. See, uh, in, in seismic acquisition, we are not only dealing with the geophysics. There are some mechanical engineers, mm. survey, uh, civil engineers, electrical engineers, and also some marine sciences people. So they are also together with this um, acquisition geometry, not only the geophysicists. The geophysicists okay. only uh, designing each and everything and doing that thing. But the other part of the acquisition system is handled by other engineers. Okay, thank you, Prof. Yasir. Okay, we have one question from uh, let me to read the answer the question first of all is there a limit to how far the air gun can emit shock waves what if the ocean floor is very far from the sea surface do we have to lower the air uh, to lower the air gun or increase the power of the shock wave okay i will i will copy the question to the to the chat room i i got the i got the question okay actually yeah. the, um, the participant want to ask either we need to enhance let's say if we have the very deep sea floor like i was showing you seven thousand feet one of the example so in that case normally we we don't uh, sink our uh, sink our what we call marine uh, air gun into the deep water we can go we cannot go beyond 10 meter because it has some limits so for if we have a very high water column then we have to increase the frequency of our signal so let's say uh, we are using from 100 hertz so maybe we can go beyond that 100 hertz to if the water column is very big but we cannot drop down our receiver or source much deeper because when it goes deeper it's not easy to control but for that case like if we have a very deep water like in gulf of mexico it is seven thousand feet so it's almost three kilometer water depth so for that case we are using they are using um, uh, 
ocean bottom node. So the receivers are not connected with the cables. So you just send the receiver which go and sit on the sea floor. When you fire the shot here, it will record the signals at the sea floor. So there will be no disturbance coming from the ocean, ocean column. Okay. Okay, thank you for the answer, Prof. Yasir. Okay, next question. Uh, sorry, Prof. Yasir, uh, I have another question. Yeah, sure. Okay, okay. okay uh, How about uh, environmental issue? Because uh, if we do acquisition in marine, can kill the fish or mammal marine like a uh, dolphin. And how to ensure uh, mm -hmm. for the day safety? Yeah, obviously, uh, uh, there are some uh, animals uh, like marine animals, uh, which, which, are, which are not directly affected by these type of, because the air gun is producing only the, the sound waves or the pressure waves. It, from sound, it converts into the pressure. When the pressure goes and hit to the ground, and it produces the waves and goes inside the. So if the animal is very big, like if you're talking about the big animals, the marine animals, probably they will not be affected by these type of things like we are using in marine exploration. But let's say if we are using some explosion and the animal is quite near to that area, probably that time they can be affected by that, uh, that sources or that explosion. But in the other hand, I think the, I have shown you the vessel is very big. So probably they cannot uh, attack to the people. <laughs> it's for sure they, they will not do that. But probably they sometimes these animals or these uh, fishes can cut the cables. But the cable is very strong, so it cannot be. But if it's a big shark or something, probably this can be happen. Okay, thank you, Papia Sir. Okay, thank you for the answer and the feedback from Mr. Aki. Next question. Oh, once again, Mr. Yasir, uh, it's okay, Ms. Uh, Mr. Marianto. Okay, one Please. question. Oh, uh, Miss Miss Nita. Okay, uh, this is about Indonesian case. Uh, as we know that Indonesia dominantly in marine, yeah, and Indonesia have tidal activity, most of tidal activity, sea breeze or land breeze. So, I want to ask you about the right time. Uh, to do some acquisition in marine, yeah, seismic acquisition in marine to get the best, uh, the best, yeah, the best result. What the right time uh, to get the best result to do the seismic acquisition in marine? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I understand your question. It's a quite interesting question, but um, uh, to give this answer, I mean, I will, I will give you the probably the the time which when your sea is not in harsh mood, I mean, there is not the surface waves or like the waves are going on. But if you're talking, if you're asking about the time, so I'm not the oceanologist or something like that. So that's why, uh, as I mentioned to the question to Mr. Komora, that um, we, we should be having these type of people like marine engineer or uh, civil engineers, these type of engineers we should have prior to do the acquisition. So we have to contact with the, I mean, uh, with the ministry or I mean people who is involved to look at the condition of the sea floor. I think as a geophysicist we we cannot say that which is the right time, but we have to contact with the with the people who are concerned with these type of issues. Okay, Punita, any feedback from you, Punita? Okay, it's enough. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next question. I think we have a question from Miss Mr. Dean. Any question, Mr. Dean?
Okay, we have one student present from Miss uh, Mr. Zajim. Okay, Mr. Zajim. Uh, okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Marianto. Uh, first of all, my name is Zajim. I'm currently student at Geophysics Engineering in ITS, batch 2019. Uh, before that, I would say thank you so much to Mr. Yasir for our, for the uh, exceptional uh, material that you give it to us. Uh, I just wonder, uh, is there any differences between uh, when when the first development of the seismic acquisition uh, of the new field and then the redevelopment that you uh, that you said on the summary or of the at the end of the presentation uh, there is uh, any differences uh, between the seismic acquisition on the first when you uh, when you uh, do the acquisition of the seismic and after the redevelopment of the field thank you yep uh, yeah actually uh, yeah there there should be some there should not be some differences but it based on your objective let's say once you acquire your seismic data and the the resolution was not that good enough let's say you find out the big reservoir but the small reservoir or tin beds are missing so if your objective is to recover these reservoirs like the small one so then you have to do acquisition with the different parameters like you have to uh, close the spacing of your hydrophone or then you have to enhance the signal to noise ratio so in that case uh, you have to do acquisition in with using different acquisition parameters and the second objective sometime you have for eor enhanced oil recovery so that is called 4d seismic you you know the 2D, 3D, and 4D. So the 3D is actually 3D data, and 4D is called the same 3D with different time. So for 4D seismic, normally what you are looking for, you are looking for enhanced soil recovery. So let's say in 2005 or maybe five year back, your reservoir contained this much hydrocarbon. So after five years, how much hydrocarbon is there? So you do again another survey and we compare the previous seismic and today's seismic and see how much reserves are left out. So that is the EOR one. And for field development, so third type of survey you do for field development. So let's say you have one reservoir here, but you can see this reservoir is maybe after 50 kilometer, maybe 50 kilometer is less, but it's in, in seismic industry, like we call uh, hundreds or 200 kilometers. Let's say your this reservoir is going to 200 kilometer or 500 kilometers. So then you have to make another acquisition or other than the area where you have them. So that is called field development. So same reservoir in a different area, you have to do another survey for field development. So that three types of survey we redo for seismic exploration. I hope I am okay. okay, thank you, Mr. Uh, but I just wonder about the uh, EOR. Uh, so if the if we need to enhance the oil, uh, oil reservoir in oil in the reservoir, mm -hmm. so uh, we must use the for the seismic yep. uh, only. Uh, we cannot use like a 3D or 2D some uh, seismic that uh, seismic acquisition or that it's a 3d actually but 3d with different time is called 4d okay i mean in one dimension you know this one dimension two dimension is x y if three dimension x y z the fourth dimension is x y z plus time so if we have a different time so it's called 4d okay uh, thank you mister uh, I just wonder, uh, does uh, C, uh, do you uh, CCUS? It's uh, does seismic uh, do do in CCUS too or not? Uh, I just wonder about that. Seismic? Sorry, <laughs> can you repeat? Uh, does seismic method uh, do in CCUS methods also or not? 
carbon capture utility storage yeah, because uh, we are also in, in industry it is had, it is being done by carbon capture storage of this using seismic as well i think there are some research and even the application is going on from that but uh, i think we are not focusing on that one that's why i didn't uh, put that topic in this one okay uh, thank you mr i just wonder uh, about ccs yeah, uh, slightly you. okay thank you have a nice day mr have a good day too. okay thank you mr jajim for the question and next we go to the next question okay we have one question from mr dean okay mr dean please Yes, sir. So, um, thank you for coming virtually, Dr. Yasir. So, um, let me have a question. Uh, in the stage of acqu acquisition, how can we know that the data quality it is good or not? Okay. Uh, so as I mentioned that um, during the acquisition, you have to do processing on feed. I mean, so you will, once you record one line, like let's say one line, so you will do the stacking, stacking of that, that in, in the seismic vessel. So you have the processing uh, in the field. So to define the acquisition parameter, but let's say, your offset is 100 meter, not 100, maybe one kilometer, but how deep you can see. So let's say if your deep structure is more deeper, then probably you have to uh, extend your offset 200 meter, uh, two kilometer. Ah, uh, I see. So these things you can define, and also the receiver interval, you can define either this is optimal or not optimal. So you do these type of processing in, in, in field, and there are some geophysicists who decide that is called acquisition geophysicists. So they decide what acquisition parameter is for this subsurface geometry, subsurface geology. But normally we must have to get the information of uh, regional geology. Let's say you, if you are going into the field, you must know that either this is carbonate field, this is plastic, this is basement, or uh, there are some complexity because we already know where is the regional uh, these are the compressional stress or extensional regime. So we know already that because of compressional, there will be strikes report or the reverse fault. If extensional, we have the horse and gravel structure. So from the knowledge of geology, we we can decide this type of parameter. But still, some th sometime uh, the, the this does not help. So that's why we have to do the pre-processing in the field. Uh, I see. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Dean, for the question. Uh, might be one question more because uh, the right now is uh, eleven o'clock. One question again. Okay. Okay. I think we, there is no question more. Uh, thank you, Mr. Yasir, for the presentation and question and answer. Uh, before we close this case lecture, uh, we have a certificate for you. Thanks so much for that. Okay. Okay, please, uh, operator, to show the certificate. Okay. Mm, okay, thank you so much uh, for the certificate. Okay, thank you so much, thank you so Prof. Much. Yasir, no, for, for, sharing your, for sharing the knowledge about the marine seismic exploration. I think seismic exploration is, is still the powerful, uh, powerful uh, method uh, to it to identify the oil and gas. Not only oil and gas, I think. Yeah, exactly. uh, I think. 
uh, this lecture ya, this full lecture ya, can <laughs> this full lecture of seismic exploration can be delivered into our <laughs> this amazing. <laughs> okay, uh, maybe there is a closing statement, Prof Yasir. Um, uh, from my side, I think uh, it's uh, nothing else. I think uh, it was quite um, difficult for me to summarize this all things, I mean, the acquisition, processing, and integration in two hours. But um, for, there's many more things during the processing, acquisition, which was missing. But uh, still, we can have some time like lectures based on specific topic, let's say it's processing or acquisition or interpretation that we can have like a uh, half day or two or three hours lectures later on. So I'm, I'm welcome for that. Okay. Thank you, Professor, for the closing statement. Uh, maybe, uh, and we in right now is still Mr. Mrs. Win, Miss Win, yeah, as the secretary of department. Okay. Uh, I think there is a closing remark from Miss Win, Lestari, yeah. <laughs> okay, Pamar, thank you so much. <clears throat> uh, actually, I want to ask some uh, one questions, Dr. Yasir, but later on, <laughs> maybe next time, hope we have a uh, a good time ya yeah, to share our knowledge again insyaallah next time uh to fully uh yeah it's a great time for us to invite you as our speaker today and thank you so much to all students that attended this lecture and all the lectures of course uh particular for usm dr andy <laughs> maybe still here he's still here right now and to our speaker dr yasir keep healthy and hope we can meet again inshallah in our in another program not only for the lecture or maybe from research or other collaborations thank you so much okay thank you Buin. uh okay once again i would like to say thank you for Ms. prof yasir basir that uh, have time to give the like lecture for Department of Geophysical Engineering Department. And I would like to say thank to uh, the audience from the student and the other participant for the attention during uh, follow this case lecture. Uh, thank you very much and see you in the next international case lecture next week. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Could we have a photo before we end the meeting, Mas Dihin? Could you take the picture? Oh, yeah. So please, students, turn on your camera so we can have a photo session with Dr. Yasir Asir. Okay, we are waiting. Win when we when will we go to the USM win visit the USM win still don't know <laughs> we can talk it yeah so let's start the photo session in three two one okay thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Yasir. Thank you, Dr. Yasir. Yes. See you. Okay, see you, inshallah. Have a good day. Bye, Thank you. Yes. So, let's close this session in three, two, one.